three, two, one. Okay, good evening, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so tonight, I would officially like to welcome you all to our webinar. I am Dr. Rasul, and with us we have Dr. Marich, who is a psychiatrist. Our topic for tonight is how to keep on going in the time of COVID. Dealing with burnout and loss in the dental surgery in these times by Dr. Antoinette Marich. Now, while we wait for our viewers to join, I'd just like to ask Dr. Marich a few questions. Dr. Marich, what motivated you to get into psychiatry as a speciality? Hi there, thanks. Thanks for having me um, speaking tonight. Um, what motivated me? You know, psychiatry never actually even crossed my radar um, until I hit fifth year medical school. And wow. then I realized that that was what I enjoyed. Um, I think it's the combination of the science and, and the art of it, um, which is kind of the, the talking bit, and then obviously the, the science and the, the psychopharmacology. Um, so it was just a natural fit from, from then onwards. And uh, do you miss the trauma side of medicine, uh, or do you prefer? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. I, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't really enjoy blood. To be honest. Okay. Um, so I'm much better on, on this side. Definitely. Um, and I wanted to also ask you, have you noticed a remarkable difference in the type of patients you've been treating now uh, compared pre-COVID, compared to now COVID being our current landscape? Um, I think the patients are the same. I mean, I, um, in terms of my own practice, it's quite a small practice, but um, I, it's been quite an interesting journey. Um, most psychiatric practices, I think like actual dentist practices, got quite quiet um, initially Definitely. and everyone kind of disappeared. Um, and, you know, then slowly people started coming back and initially they were doing fine. And these are my existing patients. Um, right. My existing patients are now struggling. Um, they really are. So I would say 80% of them have had to go up on medication, restart therapies. Mm -hmm. Um, which is quite a lot. And then the new patients who are coming in have all been affected by COVID. Um, Definitely. I think uh, now the slap is really, you know, they, mm -hmm. we're feeling the effects of it definitely. Initially, it was just a transition period and, you know, things slowed down, but people kind of enjoyed that getaway break kind of thing. And mm -hmm. now it's just the financial implications are catching up definitely. Um, definitely yeah. So before I formally introduce you, Dr. Marich, I'd just like to mention a few points for our viewers and um, yeah, just keep it in mind. So please refrain from using the raised hand feature tonight, rather type in your questions and leave your comments in the Q&A tab. Uh, also note that CPD, CPD certificates will be issued, but they will not be emailed. They will be loaded up on our SADA platform and thereafter you can access it via your member profile. If you do not have a SADA uh, membership, then do not stress. You can still create a profile for yourself and access the CPD certificates. Um, tonight's event does qualify you for one ethical point. And if you have any issues joining in on our Zoom platform, do note that we are also live streaming on YouTube, so you can uh, tune in on there. Also, after our, our webinar, there is an evaluation, and do feel free to leave any questions because Dr. Marich is here and she's free to answer them. Um, note that we do have some upcoming events. On the 30th of March, we've got a pedo society, which will be bringing four international speakers to the podium and we'll be celebrating World Oral Health Day in March. Dr. Jesse Moody will also be joining us on the 30th with the topic pediatric crowns, going from stainless steel to hybrid glass crowns. And then on the 6th of April, SADA as well as OHASA will be uh, presenting the topic of lip and tongue ties back to the basics with Dr. Connie Bezadenhout. So that's all we have with regards to our announcements. And I would now like to officially welcome our speaker for this evening. Our speaker for this evening is Dr. Marich. She is a psychiatrist 
who uh, is in private practice in Johannesburg with almost 20 years of medical experience in general and specialist practice. She has spent the first few years of her medical career working in general practice and was involved in comprehensive medical examination for corporate employees. Thereafter, she worked in psychiatry in both the public and private sector, and she's got a special interest in the management of severe mental illnesses. These include your depression, bipolar disorder, PTSD, and psychotic disorders. Her other special interests include the treatment of anxiety, mood and traumatic disorders, burnout, which a few of us can relate to, occupational psychiatry, and mental wellness, as well as mental disabilities in the workplace. Dr. Mirich has co-founded the Healthcare Workers Care Network in May 2020, and this network is aimed at providing pro bono mental health support for healthcare workers within South Africa. I would now like to hand over to Dr. Marich for tonight's session, and I hope you all enjoy it. Please note you are free to leave your question and answers in the, in the Q&A panel, and we will definitely address them before we close for tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for that um, lovely introduction. Um, it's really nice to, to be with you all tonight. Um, talking about something that I am passionate about, um, which is, um, well, first we're going to talk about anxiety, um, grief and loss, and then we're going to move on to a discussion on um, burnout. So, as you've said, I'm a psychiatrist working in um, Johannesburg, and for the last year, um, myself and a few very passionate colleagues have been really focused on looking at the mental health um, care and wellness of our fellow healthcare workers, and that includes um, all our dentists. And we formed um, the Healthcare Workers Care Network um, to, in, in conjunction with SADAC, South African Anxiety and Depression Group, in order to promote um, mental wellness, especially during the times of COVID, but it will be an ongoing um, venture. For those of you who are interested, um, our website is healthcareworkerscarenetwork.org and um, I'll discuss it a little bit later. But first, what I wanted to discuss, um, my presentation is going to be in two parts. Um, the first part is on anxiety, grief and loss in the time of COVID. And the second part will be on um, burnout, which we all are very familiar with. And, um, and some, you know, some coping skills on, on what to do about it once, once we recognize it. So what I'm going to discuss is, is loss, um, a concept called death anxiety, which sounds quite morbid, but um, it's quite interesting, and grief, um, and then grief in the time of COVID, which is an ambiguous grief, um, which means we don't quite know what to do with it, and then just a few you know, slides about complicated grief and, and what, what is that and, and what must we look out for. The world is in a sense of collective loss. Um, so South Africa is, but the world is, um, and in a state of grieving. Um, and I got these stats two days ago, and I think they've probably gone up already. You know, we're sitting at 124 million COVID-19 cases with 2.7 million deaths so far. How do we even start to make sense of these numbers? I think um, in terms of our human nature, it's, it's very, very hard. And I think once they start hitting these big numbers, we we forget sometimes that each of these numbers are a person um, and each of those people have people around them. Um, and that's what I'm trying to kind of just bring back tonight. I, part of this talk is to discuss what are the losses and, you know, we've, we've lost, we've lost lots of things in terms of um, on an individual, personal, professional level in the last year, and obviously, you know, there's the bigger global losses. And I really had to sit and think about how, how to discuss this with, with you, my esteemed colleagues. Um, and I luckily have um, a family member who's a dentist and friends. And I did speak to them um, quite a bit before this presentation to say, you know, give me an understanding of what's been going on in the last year. And I, I use the word here dentist, but I mean the entire dental surgery. And the biggest thing which has come up is it's almost like dentists are, are forgotten and 
um, you know, initially in the big heart for healthcare workers and, um, you know, protecting the frontline workers, I, I do think within the rhetoric that dentists weren't, they weren't acknowledged as much as they should be. Um, and especially in terms of the high risk procedures that you are exposed to all the time and the aerosol procedures. So one of the losses, obviously, is just the loss of kind of recognition of, of maybe your profession. Um, the other big thing which has come up quite a lot is um, employment. So, so what's happened to, to the new graduates who, you know, were quite excited to get their career going and maybe bought a practice or bought into a practice and, and then what? And then everything closed down for a while. So that's quite a big loss. And then also, you know, existing practices, big practices which have been running and you've needed to retrench people, you've needed to put people on decreased hours. Um, I am hoping that's picked up by now, but there's been massive kind of changes within the workplace. Loss of patience, patience <laughs> in both ways. Um, so patients as in literally your, your patients, um, some of them you may have known for many, many years and, and they may have passed away from COVID. Um, and, um, and the other big thing I've, I've seen, and um, I'm not sure, you know, my dentist has actually retired because he was older. And I think a lot of older dentists have um, just shut down shop, which is quite a hard way to end a career, um, which has been a very successful career. And then the, the other thing is, you know, to now we're talking about the vaccine rollout and, um, you know, in terms of risk and in terms of COVID risk, you know, I think the, um, the, the dent dentist population is very, very high risk. However, you know, my family member who is a dentist actually only got a vaccine today compared to some of the healthcare workers who um, were also, you know, frontline, but they, they got it a month ago. So once again, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that that's catching up now, but I do think that there's been quite a lot of um, losses and missed opportunities. Talking a little bit now about um, the concept of death anxiety. Um, so Menendez et al. have, um, have published a really nice paper on, um, on grief and, and fear and anxiety in the times of COVID. And they've argued that COVID-19 pre presents a unique challenges um, because of the constant reminders of death. Um, the, you know, the constant, the ever-present present images of death and daily updates of COVID-19, especially in the beginning. I'm not sure if any, any, if any of you were like me, but, you know, I was watching the numbers every night. I did stop that, um, I think, during the first wave because I was just getting too stressed. Um, and then, you know, you're watching the, the, the death rates. Um, and then it's the, the, the constant cues to death. You know, the constant cue that we are in an abnormal situation, which is, I mean, I know um, you wear face masks a lot in your surgeries, but, you know, now we all wearing face masks outside. And it means, that, I mean, this was a bit tongue in cheek, but it, he said it means that we're essentially living in an ongoing global mortality study, which I thought was quite interesting, but it is a study of how um, the human humans um, come to term with death. And this, this leads to an increase in death anxiety, generalized anxiety and fears. Fear of death is is a central component of the experience of being human. And I think most of us try and ignore it. Um, and I think what's happened in the last year, um, it's been thrown directly in our faces. And this is a lovely quote from one of my favorite um, psychologists, Yalom, um, who says, you know, we have the com cognitive um, capacity to contemplate and anticipate our own death. And so we live our lives forever shallow, shadowed by the knowledge that we will grow, blossom, inevitably diminish and die. So this, this was in terms to try and decrease um, the, the death anxiety. So as I said, we're more exposed to, you know, the reports of death and the constant bombardment of our emotions. I think especially in the beginning um, of the pandemic does lead to COVID, COVID fatigue. And I'm not just talking about COVID fatigue from contracting the virus. I'm talking about the constant hypervigilant state that we've all been in um, will lead to this state and it's otherwise known as burnout. Um, it, it just became and has become too much. I do think some people have recouped now after maybe the second wave. And 
what we're seeing is that you know the death related losses are compounded by the non death related losses which is what i discussed in the beginning so what is what else is increasing the, this anxiety and deaths and 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 people passing away within our social services are occurring without our normal attachment bonds. And I'll explain a little bit what that means in, in attachment buffers. Normally, you know, when, when someone passes away or when there's a very hard time, um, communities come together. However, because of the nature of the virus and because of the nature of the lockdowns, it has limited the family, friends, siblings who would normally come together and, and buffer that, that, that suffering. And this is quite interesting, um, which because I do think, and I was actually thinking quite a lot during this presentation about the similarities between psychiatrists and dentists, and I'll get to them a bit later. But I think as healthcare professionals, we we generally um, we are generally, and I'm going to include myself, quite type A personalities. We like to be in control, and COVID nineteen has violated that in the, in a spectacular way. Um, our life was never really in, in our complete control. But, you know, in terms of a dentistry practice, you knew that if you did this, followed these steps year to year, these would be your profits. This is where it would be going. And then all of a sudden you, you get hit with something which is totally not in your control and um, targets your very safety. So grief is the universal human response to disruption of an affectional bond, loss of a loved one. And, and when I'm also talking about grief, I'm talking about grief in terms of the losses we've experienced. And grief is the form love takes when, when someone we love dies. What's important to know about grief, and um, I know that this might be quite hard for some people that are, and I'm talking about it, but, and I understand that, that many of us have, have lost loved ones. And what I am saying may be quite triggering. Um, but what I want to re reassure everybody um, is that it, grief, especially after the loss of a significant other, is not considered a mental health disorder. Um, I actually had a patient recently, a young 20-year-old, um, whose mother passed away from, from COVID and had been in hospital for quite a while and then passed away. And I saw him probably about 10 days after his mother passed away for the first time. Um, and he was, you know, in terms of all my DSM-5 criteria, he was depressed. Um, but I was able to kind of, and he was very worried because he wasn't eating and couldn't concentrate and he couldn't sleep. And, you know, I was able to reassure him that this is not a mental health disorder. And he was very anxious that it would worsen. Um, and I asked him to come back a few weeks later with some, he had some psychological support because it was a complicated death. And, um, was much better. Still sad, but um, no need for, for any medication or any other intervention. In the time of COVID, we must be very aware of the possibility of a complicated grief process and understand that the, the different dimensions of grief, you know, the physical as in the somatic symptoms we feel, emotional and spiritual. And majority of individuals grieving do not need any other support other than family or friends. So grief in the time of COVID-19, it's complicated. <laughs> and that was going to be my, my sum total of the slide, but it is complicated. And that is because the normal human dynamics are interrupted. Um, the isolation from loved ones while they are lying well. You know, you, you're waiting for that daily call if you're lucky from the doctor, if you can get hold of the doctor. And, you know, they, they go into hospital, you, you wheel them into casualty, and then that's it. That's the last you see of it. And once again, the biggest thing is the isolation from the protective measures, which normally um, console us in the terms of grief. And travel bans, people not able to attend funerals, um, and lack of normal grieving rituals and processes. Um, and I've heard of so many stories where, you know, a family member's passed away um, from COVID and you know, the spouse has had to be in isolation for, for another week because they also had COVID. Um, it really just disrupts the, the normal 
processes, um, psychological processes that we go through as humans. Ambiguous losses and grief. It's a term to explain situations where the emotional and the physical realities don't align. Um, so example, one other thing was, you know, the MIA, so the, the missing military personnel who are presumed dead, and um, then they have a memorial or a funeral or memorial service for them, but, but there's, there's no, they never find the proof. Um, so it's an ambiguous loss. Um, another one is, you know, feeling the emotional absence of a parent with dementia. And the losses in um, COVID are ambiguous losses. And that's primarily because most times the loss is not observed and the decline may be over many days or weeks. And um, it's very hard to reconcile psychologically. I've got a few more slides on this, but you know, I'm sure everyone's aware of the um, Kubler-Ross stages of, of grief. Um, and it's a very, very common, um, commonly referred to process. It was described as quite a linear process where you move through stages of anger, denial, bargaining, acceptance, and then, um, yeah. But we, we've since kind of worked on that quite a bit. Um, and it's, we know it's not a linear process, nor is it ever over. And every person's journey through grief is unique. I really liked um, the work of Warden, um, Warden um, and he, he described four tasks of mourning. Um, and this is for grief, but this is also for the losses we've experienced. Um, and I think they're quite simple, um, practical um, suggestions, or, you know, theories to accept. So one of them is to accept the reality of loss. Um, I think we all had to accept that quite quickly last year. Um, I think most of us will have got to, in terms of just the loss of, of normality, but in terms of the loss of a, of a loved one, one of the first stages is, is the acceptance. One of the next stages, which is a very painful um, stage, which can go up and down in waves is to process the pain of grief. And that obviously will get worse with, with anniversaries and special events. The third task he describes is how to adjust to a world without the deceased. You know, how, how do you go on? Um, you know, there's external adjustments in terms of practical things, internal adjustments and spiritual adjustments um, and finding meaning and, you know, look, there's a new world now without, without the loved one. And the last task, which is, which is particularly lovely, is to, to find the enduring connection with the deceased um, while embarking on your life's journey. Um, and that ties into ex acceptance. Um, without acceptance of the loss, you, you can't really um, find that ongoing connection and however you, you feel. Um, and I'm finding that a lot of people, especially with COVID, you know, their spirituality or whatever belief systems they, they had, um, did suffer because, you know, there weren't the, the constant reminders, people weren't going, um, going to church. Um, and this may be, something that you need to reconnect with um, in order to, in whichever way you, you believe. Just a few, um, talk just a few points about complicated grief. Um, so as I said, grief is not a mental health disorder at all. Um, and we, we don't treat it like that and nor, nor should anyone. But what we do look out for, and I think in terms of COVID-19, Complicated grief is, um, is normally found in about 10% of bereaved persons. The percentage is expected to increase with all these ambiguous losses. It's when we look out for them, it's grief symptoms are prolonged and it's difficult for the person to rebuild. And we're looking at symptoms, really severe symptoms lasting longer than six months, frequently complicated by post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and can cause impairment in the daily functioning often very hard to recognize within yourself and actually may go on for many months or years and it often requires psychological treatment and at times medication may be needed. So how do you support someone who is grieving? Um, how do you support someone within your surgery? How do you support someone within your family? Um, these are just a few, few points which um, generally um, can assist. It's encouraging connection, 
it's validating the loss. And as I discussed, you know, dis discussed, consider the cultural and religious dimensions, encourage reaching out for support if appropriate, encourage activities that gave meaning before, and compassionate listening. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about compassion now when I move on to the discussion on burnout. So I'm going to talk about burnout now. And um, the, the two topics do link in that I think the, the ongoing um, losses, and especially if you've lost loved ones, um, plus in combination with the work stresses um, in your surgeries and your um, pre-morbid or your, your types of personalities um, predispose you to burnout and predispose all of us, and I'm including all healthcare workers um, in this. So what I wanted to do is I've, I've done quite a lot of research looking at you know, what's been happening in, in doctors, what's been happening in, in frontline workers. And they, there's a few studies on, on dentists and the dental surgery. Um, and actually the, the, the statistics are very similar to, to across the, the health spectrum. There was quite a lovely study, which is a, well, it's a preprint um, and it's a descriptive literature review and by Loriona et al, who's Italian, looked at over 11 studies and looked at over 5,000 dentists. And um, most of these were cross-sectional. So looking at experiences of dentists at a point in time, some of them were quite big studies, um, like 1,500 people. And these were the, the fears and anxieties mentioned um, in most studies um, in the dental surgery. So fear of being infected by a patient or a coworker, taking the infection home to loved ones, job insecurity, um, and specifically job insecurity um, was linked to depression, which I think is quite, quite interesting. Um, fear of becoming infected and then not being able to work, which is quite an interesting one. Um, I think especially when you are running a solo practice, you know, hopefully you would have income protection, but you know, the worry about being infected or having to step out of the workplace for, for two weeks is quite significant. And then one of the big fears with dentists was when returning to work, um, the confidence of being able to work, work safely um, in your environment. And all of these, these fears um, and these, these anxieties um, and what I'm going to go through now, which is, which is the, the threat to mental health, all predisposed to the development of burnout. So why is COVID-19 so different? I've alluded to some of it before. But there's three major components which have resulted in almost the perfect storm of the development of mental health conditions, the threat to health, which you're very well aware of, the social isolation and loneliness, and then the financial stressors. And the any one of these can cause a, a mental health condition, um, but the combination, um, and then, you know, with all of us just trying to maintain our practices, plus dealing with all of this. Um, leads to extreme fatigue um, and feelings of being very overwhelmed. So this is, um, these are, is there are a few studies looking at high-risk healthcare workers and I left it in even though it referred mainly to, to, to doctors and nurses, but when I looked through the dentistry literature, um, it was very similar um, stats. So females um, struggled more in terms of psychological distress during this time frontline workers which um, and direct exposure to COVID, which, which you are, um, colleagues being unwell and colleagues passing away, and um, the younger and less experienced um, people, and specifically looking in the dental surgeries, um, a lot of the, the younger um, dental hygienists, or um, <laughs> they, they also linked, you know, um, maybe being the feelings of being underpaid and underappreciated um, also linked to psychological distress. And I haven't even put in here, you know, the whole drama about PPE in the beginning of, um, of this um, pandemic. And I, I know it was, it was a big issue with dentists um, having to try and scramble and, you know, reusing PPE and making sure that the rooms are, are clean. Um, there was lots and lots of more complicated factors going into your work. So prior to COVID-19, 
um, high levels of stress and burnout were already present in dental staff. So the dentistry staff, this is not a surprise to any of you. And I'm going to be sharing just um, some information on what what are what is burnout and what are the signs of burnout. And then, you know, most of us, I think, have had it. I've had it, definitely. Um, and I think I've got a bit better at recognizing it. Um, but once you recognize it, what do you do? So looking at burnout and stress in the dentistry um, surgery, um, Basson, who's South African, looked at a burnout within the dentistry surgery. And this is where I say I started to look at the similarities a little bit between psychiatry and dentistry. But he, he identified three major contributing areas, um, work-related stresses, the dentist-patient um, interaction, and the personality traits of the clinician. So in terms of the work-related stresses, um, workload, a very, very high patient load and time pressure leads to exhaustion. And I'm sure you move from patient to patient and now you're moving from patient and then moving rooms and cleaning. It just adds to the stress um, of burnout. Lack of sufficient control. So this was prior to, prior to COVID, but you know, insufficient control over resources and funding, knowing that you need to do some work um, and there's just no funding for it. And, you know, the stress of, of dealing with funders, medical aids, um, occupational hazards. So this was exposure to infections anyway, before COVID, um, noise, radiation, specifically in the, in the dental surgery. And this is where I think there is a similarity with psychiatry um, that there are often quite a lot of lone, <laughs> lone, lone ranges or lone practices. And there is a lack of social support um, at times. And, you know, I think some people, you know, like to work like that, but with the lack of social support and increased isolation, once again, you lose out on that natural human connection, which actually prevents against burnout. And then the quality of, of working life, the physical environment, the, um, the pain, maybe if you, you know, if you, I can imagine you're using your hands all the time, I'm sure your hands get quite strong, but there must be quite a lot of pain conditions, the posture, of the positions you need to, to hold. And then now the PPE required, um, especially you know, in the beginning, um, but also now um, it, it really, it, it's incredibly hot to wear, it's incredibly heavy and, and it's expensive. So this is where um, <laughs> one of the similarities come through, um, other than the first one, which was the, well, I don't know, maybe we could agree to disagree, but maybe, being perceived as the inflictor of pain, and this was a, another South African bot who looked at burnout and stresses within the, the dental surgery. Um, I never really thought about this too much um, because I'm, I'm actually not too, too worried about um, my own going to the dentist, but I've heard from many patients and I've had to work with many patients to overcome their, their fear of dentists, which is a proper phobia. Um, and how to get them back in the chair in order to, to get the work that they need. Dealing with uncooperative, difficult patients. So this is where we're quite similar, um, treating nervous patients. And, you know, one of the comments for here was playing the dual roles of therapists and dentists because um, you, you need to be able to have your patient as calm as possible um, in order to do the work which um, you need to do and that requires quite a lot of skill, um, which unlike psychiatrists, I don't think you get much training in counseling and how to um, decrease the stress in your nervous patients. And I think it must get incredibly, I mean, as psychiatrists, we, we find it very, very emotionally taxing. Um, and now you're dealing with nervous patients and they're nervous of COVID and they're nervous of the dentist. And, and they avoid coming and then they come and then they've got major problems. Um, and it's the one-on-one -on -one interaction, um, which is the same as us. Um, although, yeah, you know, you can kind of put stuff in their mouth to stop them talking, but um, you do need to calm them down um, first. Um, lack of recognition and appropriate award. Um, because, because the results of dentistry are not always seen, um, literally not always seen. Um, 
the workmanship and the skill is often not appreciated. And um, especially, I suppose, when, when it comes to pay, um, I, I hear many people complaining of, of prices of dentistry, as I, as I hear of people complaining about prices of psychiatrists. Um, and then there's the lack of appreciation. Um, and maybe you, maybe you will get appreciation from, from some people, but I'm not sure if it's, and you know, you can discuss it in the chat about how much this does happen, but humans need validation. So with the lack of appreciation and the lack of recognition, you may lead to feelings of being ineffective and having a decreased confidence. And this is this is the other thing where we where we're quite similar, I think, in terms of all healthcare workers. Um, and I still haven't quite come to the answer. You know, I, I am aware that the the suicide rate in, in the dentistry community, dentists specifically, is high. Um, and I think it's to do with the the inbuilt personalities. But the suicide rates in dentists, um, psychiatrists, emergency medicine doctors, and anaesthetists is high. So we all fit into the same category. And obviously, you know, suicidal ideation is, is at the end of a burnout and a severe depression. But some people don't get burnt out as much. Um, and that's because they don't have the same personality traits as us. So, um, but burnout is found in, in individuals with um, low levels of resilience and low self-esteem. I don't think that's necessarily a trait of, um, of dentists because I think, or healthcare workers, because I think by the nature of um, getting to where you've, you've got, it's a lot, a lot of hard work um, and commitment. But if you are slightly, do you have a lower level of resilience or you did, you have struggled with um, pre-morbid mental health conditions or childhood, adverse childhood events, you, you, your resilience can be impaired. And I think everyone's resilience has been challenged in the last year. A passive avoidant or defensive coping style. And I think most of us do have this. Um, and for most of us, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a neurotic kind of defense um, mechanism. So, so often we're not shouting and screaming um, when we when we upset, we hold it in, we avoid, um, or we get very, you know, passive aggressive. And what happens is persons who suppress negative emotions, and I've added in here, and don't express them in a healthy way, are more prone to burnout. Because I always ask people, well, where do those emotions go? If they're all sitting in you, this this anger, this frustration, and and if they don't come out, they they do go somewhere. And then this is the type A behavior, which I think by the nature of your work um, is a strength, you know, in order to be perfectionistic, in order to work quite quickly and, and carefully. Um, but it's the same strength, which is a weakness in terms of, you know, becoming more prone to burnout. Um, just one comment on burnout um, here is I'm aware that some you know, quite a few of the, the dental um, surgeries closed down initially through lockdown, not all of them did. And, and, I'm, and I've seen it across medical practices that there was quite a loss of income um, for some of us initially, and especially in dentistry with your, your high monthly costs. And I think what people have done, um, <laughs> I told my family member to go and, go and leave, um, so I hope she did, but is you, you needed to make up those costs so you then started working even harder and you might be working even harder right now. However, this is probably not going to end well. So I think it's just be very important to be aware of what you what you are doing. So stress, increased stress, which is in COVID, leads to increased exhaustion, which leads to burnout. And then we start seeing it um, and it becomes a clinical depression. These are the healthcare worker important relationships. So um, the first relationship is you with yourself, and then it's with your colleagues and your patients. But if you don't look after yourself, you can't have those interactions with patients or colleagues. And this is the missing step that lots of us has forget. So the, the um, Maslach, um, Prof Maslach in the, the US has done most of the work um, and defined burnout initially. And she described it as a, a syndrome of 
and I'm going to go into this in more detail, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishment that can occur amongst individuals who work with people in some capacity. So that describes all of us. So it's, it's if you look back at the picture, it's, I never, I never got this before, but burnout is literally like a candle being burnt out. They, all the oxygen is, is being sucked out the room because there is nothing more to give and to keep the flame alive. So does any of this sound familiar? Um, and I know this because I've been there. Um, I can't take this anymore. Um, I just need a break. And you know, repeat this daily, like I just need to get out of here. I just can't face another patient. This workplace is just awful and tox toxic. I'm done. Um, and then, you know, maybe internally, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I'm not strong enough for this. Um, so what are the key drivers of burnout? This is quite a um, complicated um, diagram, but these are the most important things which results in um, creating meaning in work. And when all of these factors are not optimally they're not optimum. It results in, in a burnout um, and a cynicism, exhaustion, and an ineffectiveness. And so these things I've discussed along the way. So it's your workload, your job demands, control, lack thereof, work life integration, um, social supports, organizational culture and values, um, efficiency and resources. And when it's more optimal, you're more engaged and you're more vigorous. Um, and you more dedicated and you'll be more absorbed with your work. So what is burnout? Um, and it, it reflects an uneasy relationship between an individual and their workplace. Burnout cannot exist. Um, not, no, let me, let me rephrase that. Burnout in the workplace cannot exist without a workplace. Um, so there is other types of burnout, for example, you know, care of burnout, so someone's looking after um, a sick relative or uh, an elderly, that, that's care of burnout. But what's important to know is it's, it, it's an occupational related hazard. It's not just experiencing a bad day or week. Um, and I think what's important to know is it does not occur because an individual is weak or not resilient. People who have lower resilience are more prone to it. Um, the other thing to know is it's not just an evil or purely awful workplace. And I think when you feel so awful um, about, you know, going to work, and I think it's quite, quite easy and quite natural to, to blame the entire system around you rather than to look at, you know, what's going on within you and how it takes a person and a workplace um, in order to become burnt out. So therefore, reversing it requires the focus on both. So these are the three major signs. Um, and, you know, if I could see you, I probably would see you nodding, nodding along. Um, but it's exhaustion, um, loss of personal accomplishment, and depersonalization. Um, and the exhaustion is not just a you know, having a tired day. It's a physical and emotional exhaustion. One of the big signs of burnout is being exhausted when you wake up um, in terms of work, waking up to go to work. So maybe on the weekends, you wouldn't be as exhausted. But when you're waking up to go to work, um, it's that, that dreading feeling. Um, and then with the exhaustion comes the lack of awareness of what's actually going on. So the cognitive and emotional changes. Um, depersonalization, I'm going to talk a little bit more about now, but also the loss of accomplishment. So um, as you become exhausted and more and more exhausted, you've got less to, le less to give. So you become detached. And as you become more detached, you will get less appreciation from your patients because they're sensing the detachment, which results in you having less personal accomplishment, which results in less positive emotions, which increases the burnout. So the exhaustion, um, I've spoken about it a bit. So one of the, um, the there's an emotional and the physical. So the emotional is, is a cynicism, um, which um, 
I think many of us use. Um, so we use humor as a, as a way to cope, but it's, it's more, it's just a pervasive um, cynicism, um, irritability, um, lack of compassion. And, you know, it's hard for us to admit this, but when we are like that, we aren't as compassionate. And it's actually one of my first signs of burnout is when I'm not as compassionate for my patients as, as I normally would be. And the physicalness, as I said, the tiredness before work, and you have an overactive HBA axis and your sympathetic nervous system um, is on overdrive and it results in, in just this lethargy. And this is where I think hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll take notice of the cognitive signs of burnout because we don't recognize this. Um, and burnout's not depression, but in this way, it's quite similar. Um, so you lose the ability to focus and concentrate. Um, and this is when I always ask people, you know, is it new or is it, um, is it, is it, is it your baseline or is it new? Um, loss of patience. Um, since this is the loss of patience with your patients. Um, you struggle to take perspectives um, of the patients. You may not be so tolerant of, of the anxious patient who's told you a million times that they don't like dentists. I, um, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't think what that would be like, you know, um, to be told, you know, you know that, that people don't like, like you um, for what you do to them. Um, you lose a cognitive flexibility. Um, it does impair medical decision making. And um, this is also something which, you know, you can start to pick up and, and start to recognize what your signs are. And it affects your working memory. So that's your ability to hold lots of information and, and manipulate it in your mind. The depersonalization. So it's a dis distant or an indifferent attitude towards work. And this is what I said earlier. So that realization that your level of subjective caring isn't the same. And it takes a lot more work to be fully present with a patient. And you put a lot of energy into literally just being like a nice human. And then you're absolutely exhausted when you get home because you've used all your energy. Um, but it can be quite a corrosive quality. And so it can sneak, seep into other areas of your life. You might be aware of it, but even too depleted to do anything else. And as I said earlier, it re results in that lack of that positive feedback mechanism, which results in this loss of accomplishment because you're going to get bored um, because what's the point? You're not getting appreciated, but actually you're not getting appreciated because maybe you're not engaging as much. Um, so the Maslach Burnout in Inventory, and I've put a link here um, and you can actually Google it. I would advise all of you to go and do the Manslick Burnout injury, um, Inventory. It's all over the internet. And it looks at these different areas and it tells you which, which area you are, um, you are deficient in. And I think when we do cross-sectional surveys of all healthcare workers, the, the average burnout rate is probably a good 40% um, at any stage. So now, okay, so I've told you about burnout and I've said, well, We've all had it, um, but maybe you're sitting there right now, um, or maybe you recognize it. So now what? Um, no one size fits all. We need to look at the drivers, which was that, that diagram I spoke to you earlier. You need to think about what will help you. So, you know, I can tell you lots of self-help tricks and do this and do this, but you really need to try and figure out when I've been here in my life before, what has helped me before. It's also useful to have an understanding of your different emotional states and recognize the signs. So I think most people, most healthcare workers, when they hit their first burnout, they actually don't know what it is. Um, they look at it maybe in retrospect. Um, so someone like myself who's been practicing for many years, I do recognize it and I, I put in frequent, frequent breaks as much as I can in order to kind of regulate that I don't move into a burnout position. So which area can I tackle? So this is where you look at what you can tackle. So it's not just the workplace. It's not just the workplace must fix things because if you wait for the workplace to fix things, you're gonna be waiting for a long time. So there are other areas you can look at. So it's, it's about looking, if you look at all those, those three areas, identify in terms of work, which areas are potentially driving exhaustion and try some changes just to assess the impact, even if you try it for a week. So, working smarter, not harder. I think often when you burnt out, you, um, 
you maybe, I don't know, maybe you take the more complicated route of doing things. Um, you, you know, you don't delegate enough. Um, so it is about working smarter, not harder, setting realistic goals, saying no more frequently. Um, and this is, this is very hard in our profession. And then, as I said, because, you know, we've had a financial impact, I think it must be quite hard to say no to, to, to more work um, if you need it. Taking more breaks, and I know this is easier said than done, but most of us don't take breaks, um, proper breaks. And um, when you are in the state, if you want to sustain working, you're going to need to put some breaks in. Taking things less personally, know that you're in quite a vulnerable space and changing up your routines, you know. Um, I think you probably are in a very set routine, but sometimes just changing things around. Um, I took on, you know, slightly different type of work in the last year and um, I changed my weekly routines and it definitely made things less, um, less strenuous even though I was still working hard, but I was doing different things on different days. Accentuating the positives in work, um, making time for the positive in work. Pay more attention to your accomplishments. Pay more attention to the work that you do. Um, know yourself, um, understand the concept of counter transference. Now this is, this is a psychological term um, and it's basically when a patient comes in and you know when you when you just can't stand that patient or um understand that it's probably because the patient's reminding you of something in your past or something else and um try and not grab onto that emotion and hold it with you the rest of the day um so understand that there's something going on there transition periods are specifically when you um, leaving, leaving work, um, I often advise people to, you know, maybe when they're leaving, they must switch off, you know, listen to some music, um, when they're really stressed, you know, and before they enter their house, do some breathing exercises or anything, you know, anything that you think would help you. Um, some people use exercise as a transition um, to get back into to their home. And then looking at leisure time. Um, and I think we, we, all, um, we all don't do enough of this, but I think you, you need to really understand that in order to sustain your practice, if you don't build in these really important um, things into your day, you, you're, not, you're going to struggle. Um, and these are things that you hear about all the time, but they do work. Um, one of them is rest, but not, not always just pure rest is, is, a, is a cure for burnout. Um, in fact, you know, too much sleeping can make it worse, but it's more maybe relaxation, getting out in nature. Um, exercise is a, is a big, big driver here. Um, doing other, I mean, it might feel like um, strange to take on other work, but, you know, volunteer for half an hour doing something else. It, it fills you up in a way which is different from work. If you're now looking at the workplace and you know you you know you're not quite sure how to carry on, <coughs> um, these are some examples in the literature of certain things to do. So, um, change direction. Um, you know these are quite dramatic, but changing your workplace, um, changing your job roles, changing your job title. You know either um, upskilling or you know, maybe, you know, working in, in a slightly different field for a while. And you can either do this temporarily or, you know, even on a day-to-day -day basis. But this is something that can, can help in terms of the workplace. Social support from colleagues. And this is one of the, the problems I do think with dentistry and, as I said, psychiatry, because we are in our little silos um, and we don't have um, you know, we have our, our assistants and, and, you know, your dental hygienist or your dental assistants and your receptionist, um, but we often don't have that support from colleagues. So that's why I suppose forums like this are really important, um, even though we can't see each other, we all know we're here. Um, it's, it's a place to go and laugh and, and use humor to get comfort, insight um, and compassion, compassion for each other um, and then professional support. 
um, people understand where you, where you are. Um, they understand the challenges. So now you may be thinking, you know, where, where do I even start with this? So I've, I've said a whole lot of things and I've said, you know, you can try this. Um, so as I said, go and try and do one of the burnout scales. So the NASLAC burnout inventory and um, see where you're scoring. Um, I dare you, go and see where you're scoring and see what, at which, which one you, you are more burnt out on. So is it the emotional exhaustion, the depersonalization or the loss of accomplishment? Then look at the areas which are most making the most impact. You know, if it's emotional exhaustion, perhaps you um, are giving, giving too much to your patients. Perhaps you are, you are expending too much energy, too much worry, too much fear, too much anxiety on them. Perhaps you are taking on, as we say, this counter-transference, you're taking on their stuff. Um, you're not you're not putting that boundary boundary up enough, and remembering that working full out, working really hard physically will lead to emotional exhaustion, because your body cannot keep just keep going, you know, can't just keep going on. Um, then look at what changes you can make. Um, there are lots and lots of great books and podcasts um, are on on this topic. Um, so I would look in the, the Apple. What is it, Apple Podcast Store? Um, and see, maybe just listen to a few. It, it, they really, they really got some great, simple, simple ideas. Um, look at Christine Maslach's books. Um, as I said, she was the kind of guru talking about burnout. And and consider professional support. Um, I was actually thinking, I, I don't have many dentists in my practice, um, and I don't think many psychiatrists do. Um, and that's that's a whole other discussion. But we, I don't actually have that many doctors in my practice. And this is because healthcare workers, healthcare practitioners do not reach out for help. Um, and hopefully, you know, dentists aren't um, self-prescribing in terms of the psychiatric medication. Um, I, I know that um, doctors aren't um, self-prescribing, which is one of the limitations in our health system that we can self-prescribe. Self um, but I also think people there's this big stigma around reaching out for professional support. So that's medication, but then there's also therapeutic support um, in different ways, you know, business coach, life coach, um, church counselor, psychologist, um, anything, you know, and this is where, you know, our healthcare workers care network comes in. Um, it's a, it's a volunteer organization, which was um, started during COVID, but it's to support um, healthcare workers, and we have had a few dentists reach out to the network, and um, we offer four pro bono sessions of counselling um, by a qualified um, mental health care practitioner. So please go to the website, and you'll see all the details, and you can um, request help online, or you can phone the helpline, and they'll put you through to to the the centre where we can allocate. These are some useful links, so I suggest if you want to take a screenshot of this um, page. Um, this wellbeingandcoping.net is a very useful um, website with some really just simple, simple ways of coping, you know, how do we cope for three minutes, how do we cope for 30 minutes. Um, there's our website, as I said. And this is actually a really nice article, this last one. It's called, if you just Google it, Reversing Burnout, How to Rekindle Your Passion for Work. And it goes through a lot of what I've discussed now. Um, the other thing is to recognize burnouts in each other. Um, and I think, I think in psychiatry, we, or maybe it's just a group of psychiatry friends I have, um, we've, we've got this down quite well in that we we are quite comfortable in calling each other out a bit and saying, how are you doing? Are oh, you not working too hard? Um, which I'm prone to do, I'm prone to work too hard. So um, it's always a reminder. So I think it's about um, looking at it, looking for it in each other. Um, you know the signs, um, you know, if you are a senior dentist and a practice with junior dentists who, you know, tell them to take some leave, tell them to take some time out because maybe they don't have children and, you know, they can work. Um, but they are going to burn themselves out and they're going to lose their passion for dentistry, which is why you went into it in the beginning. And these are my references. 
um, and I will make the presentation available if, if you um, would like it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mirato. Over to our Q&A uh, panel, asking if you believe that there will be an excess death rate from untreated depression and suicide caused by unnatural constraints due to COVID-19. And is there any published data on this issue at the moment or not? So there is, um, there's not much published data. So there's, there's been lots of talk of, you know, the suicide rate is going to increase. Um, and so far, there hasn't been any specific published data on that. But what we have, there is some interesting data. If you go to, a, um, it's called the UK COVID-19 social study. Right. And what they've been doing is they've been measuring the general public. And they've looked at over 800,000 different entries. And they've been measuring the levels of depression in the population. And they've been tracking it to the different levels of lockdown. And wow. um, it's a very, it's, it's fascinating if you're interested in the numbers, but um, one, one of the scales they do looks at depression and looks at self-harm and looks at suicide. And what's been quite reassuring from that study is that that number, so the number of people that is a positive response has stayed almost completely stable throughout the entire pandemic. And that's in the UK. Wow. Um, so... Yeah. Will there be an, you know, there, there were also quite early some, some things showing that there was a decreased rate of suicide. So I do think that maybe when we look at averages, I don't, I don't personally think it's going to go up that much because of the averages. Um, okay. However, there's lots of antidotal evidence of, you know, people saying, oh, you know, they've, they've killed themselves or uh, they've died by suicide. So mm. no, so there isn't much published data at this stage. And we also, we're very careful because we don't want to sensationalize um, suicide. Of course, of course. People are already living in fear. And uh, I definitely understand that we don't want to sensationalize it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, another question. I think you have addressed this, but you can just maybe shed light on the frequency. Um, but basically, the question is, do you think that dentists should visit a, a psychologist, psychiatrist, or therapist once a month for essential emotional healing sessions. Um, so I don't know if you want to make mention of how many times a month or <laughs> uh, however much you think is necessary. <laughs> you I can think, just give I think, some guidelines. I think, if the, if, I think if Anonymous thinks once a month is a great idea, then I think that's a great idea. Um, so psychiatrists and psychologists, um, I mean, if I think about myself, I'm in therapy every week and I see a supervisor in terms of dealing with my cases. Um, obviously, we're dealing with a lot of trauma and, and stuff which we need to debrief. Um, and I, I do think that it, it, it would be useful, um, especially when you're in very high volume practices. And at the moment, when everyone's coming in stressed, they're either coming mm -hmm. in financially stressed or they've just lost a relative or now they're terrified you're going to give them COVID. Um, so, yes, I, I do think... Um, I think it would be useful in, in certain times, but it's not necessary all the time. Um, but yes, I mean, as I say, I, I look after my own mental health so I can help my own patients. Definitely. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's more about the fear of being stigmatized or, or mm. just this notion that we have that um, it's, it's not okay to go to a therapist or it's not good to talk about emotions. Um, uh, so I think it's definitely something that we do need to prioritize. I mean, our own mental health as we are literally working with other people and they come in with their issues. And mm -hmm. as a dentist, sometimes you gain so much of insight into people's lives when they come in and before you treat them, even though you, they don't talk much <laughs> once you start, uh, they, they come in and they tend to trust you and open up about their family life mm -hmm. and what's happening. And you've also got to debrief yourself and unpack that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, also, someone you, don't, also, you don't have the, yeah. I mean, you haven't had the, the, the training as much as, you know, of someone course. like us. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes we don't even know how to approach. No. Definitely. Um, okay, so someone else says, do you think older dentists cope with emotional issues better? So, 
That's interesting. So the research has been showing that um, during COVID, um, older dentists, older dentists, older healthcare workers have been doing better. Um, that might be because they have um, faced quite a lot of adversity before, um, and they've developed a lot more resilience and coping mechanisms. Um, so as a general looking at the data, yes, of course, but obviously there's individuals who, but generally um, our older professionals, um, I don't know, I suppose myself included, are, you know, do, do better than the, the newer, newer graduates. Right. Um, and then someone else says, after being infected with COVID, um, I feel irritated with everyone around me. Should I see a psychiatrist? <laughs> Um, it depends. Are you, are you irritated because you were infected with COVID? No. Um, I, I recently actually just done a big presentation on COVID and, and um, COVID-19 and mental health effects. And um, so one of the highest risk in healthcare workers predictions, predictors of depression um, is them being infected with COVID-19 or knowing a close colleague who's been very ill. Um, those are the big, biggest predictors. So the irritation could be because of a lingering um, psychological effect. Um, and it also depends, you know, were you infected and admitted? Um, that, that's a whole nother ballgame. Um, but remembering that irritation, especially if it's not your baseline um, personality, can be a sign of a mental health condition. Um, I have seen, I mean, I've seen in a few people, COVID-19 kind of, um, it, it, it's an inflammatory condition and it affects the brain and we are seeing depressions which are, are caused by it, the infection itself um, that they're treatable they are treatable but um, I think it, it's going to form part of this, the long COVID um, which we're going to see coming okay and then someone says what is the best approach when dealing with burnout um, if you feel like you've answered any of the questions you can just Mm. Say that, um, yeah. So uh, he, the the anonymous uh, says that extended leave from work is not always possible. Yeah, no, extended leave is not always possible. Um, and one of the ways, you know, I, I think I have answered it. Um, yes, you, you can kind of shift up your your working day, and and one of the ways which um, we've we've been saying is is maybe looking for micro moments of joy during the day. Um, or micro moments of, of calm and it regulates down your your nervous system um, so yeah it's, it's a difficult one but I, I think the other thing here is extended leave from work is not always the solution because you're going back to the same workplace of course I understand what you're saying if that's the trigger then maybe you need to change your situation or change those factors and figure mm. out what exactly it is in the workplace that's yeah. bugging you. Um, like you said, change direction or change role in the workplace. Mm. Um, okay, we've had a lot of positive comments as well. Thank you for an informative and much needed presentation. Thank you for the webinar. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's any other questions that we haven't addressed. Uh, I think you've addressed most of them. Someone else speaks about uh, other factors that may negatively contribute to stress in the work environment uh, and factors that are outside of the work environment mm. and how to deal with those, such as spousal dissonance, family issues. Maybe you can just give some pointers on, 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 on the family mm. side of things. Of course. I mean, the, any, any outside stressor, which COVID has brought a lot of, um, will result in a decreased um, ability to cope with the normal pressures of work, um, which will then result in, you know, increased stress and increased burnout. So yes, it definitely is a, a big contributor and it lowers, lowers your, I, I, I think of it like a bucket um, and you, we all, um, we all have kind of a certain level of stress that we can cope with in our buckets. And, um, and then what, what happened with COVID is, is it put another whole layer on top of what we already cope with. So now our bucket's full. And then you throw anything else on top and then the bucket's overflowing and then the, the brain doesn't 
work very well. So this is where those factors increase. And I think with COVID, it's, it's definitely, as I've said before, the perfect storm um, of yes. so many factors. And then, I mean, I don't know if you, I mean, you must have been, but, you know, in January, um, specifically in January, I think when we all kind of got back from leave, if you went on leave and went back to work, um, I mean, in our profession and families, and we were hearing of people passing away every day. Um, it was awful. And, um, and that kind of constant, constant pressure is, is very, very hard when we're just trying to kind of earn a living and, and keep working. Exactly. Um, I feel like personally, uh, you know, you live within your bubble and you're just surrounded by news of close family and friends passing away uh, pre-COVID. And now with yeah. COVID, it's like every day there's information that you're being bombarded with, with the numbers increasing and people that you haven't even heard of. And like you said, it's like we don't have um, something to blame for the increasing numbers, you know, it's just, we've got to come to terms with the fact that this is the reality of it. And I'm sure that most of our viewers can relate to so many of the aspects that you've discussed. It has been challenging for families as well as dentists within private practice throughout this journey of COVID. And definitely most of the tools that you have imparted are going to enable us to be supportive of fellow people and colleagues and their situation, because it's so easy to just think of yourself as I and not think of the other person um, and then also I mean for me the research that you included in your presentation definitely helps shed light on other medical practitioners as well as dental practitioners that have been in the same situation that most of us are in so it's really helped um, and also the awareness of what we are feeling and going through is definitely important in order to properly balance stress, like you said. I think for me, it's been able to identify when I'm at the edge of burnout and for most people as well. So the keynotes that you gave us where you need to be able to identify and do things to kind of add to yourself was definitely important because being able to identify that and then do something about it, I suppose, is what's important without feeling ashamed or stigmatized. Um, and I think that's that's an important thing. And I know I'm definitely going to do the Maslach assessment tonight. <laughs> yeah, I think I think everyone will be a bit surprised on how these calls are. Yes. And thank you for sharing all of those tools as well as the research and references and your useful links. It's been a pleasure having you and listening to you. And definitely I've screenshotted a few things that I'm going to implement and I'm sure our viewers have as well. And I'd like to thank our viewers for being present and for being so patient and for really just being so interactive as well on our Q&A panel. And thank you to Sada as well and our support team that's been doing all the scenes behind, uh, you know, all the behind the behind the scenes work and ensuring that this was a success tonight. And thank you to you, Dr. Marij, for your informative presentation as well. It's a pleasure, thank you. Thank you.